Generally, friends, when you think about going to church, you don't think that you're going to die before you come home again. And yet, historically speaking, the church has not always been a place of love and joy and tolerance. If you go back in time far enough, and I'm talking 17th century and before, uh, the church could very well end your life, depending on how you chose to live that life and whether or not you came into conflict with the church around you. Welcome to our second installment of the week-long discussion of lawfare, and we're going to talk about lawfare as it relates to the law of God. What is the purpose for which God gave us his law? Is it to use as a weapon against one another? What does the Bible say? What does the world say? All that and more today on Something's Happening Here. May God bless you. Welcome to the show. Welcome back, friends. Today is Wednesday, and it's only our second show of the week, not our third, because, as I've mentioned a few times, Talking Donkey International is going through a transition right now, and the what you see on your end will kind of follow as a tale of those transitions, but that is the reason why we are currently in a three-show-per-week format instead of the uh, traditional five shows. But... We are still talking about the same general topic that we started with on Monday, the concept of lawfare. And today we're going to continue the discussion, but in the theological realm instead. So Monday we talked about the laws of the United States and how they appear to be being used uh, against former President Donald Trump, who is currently the candidate for President Donald Trump. Today we're going to talk about the law of God. Uh, specifically the Ten Commandments and also the, the other principles and little smaller laws that come with that. Uh, and we're going to ask the question. Somehow the law of God immune from that. Um, how, wh what does it look like when the law of God is misused? What are some examples? And what does the Bible ultimately say? I want to start, before we even get to the article for today, I want to acknowledge some real-life history as an illustration of how the law of God can be used as a form of lawfare. Now, you may be aware that the concept of witchcraft in the scriptures is one of the things that God expressly, specifically, and wholly condemns and forbids. For his people. It was so bad that it was such a, a bad offense that God tells his people routinely to search these people out and even destroy them because they're like a spiritual cancer on, on Israel and, and on God's people. And so in America, when we talk about witches, we often, our minds often go to the the Salem witch trials that were popularized by um, by the the play of the Crucible, and the point of that of that story and that piece of history is is that we should not rush to judgment. That probably these women were just normal women, but the kind of frenzy of the evil of witchcraft condemned them all by itself right so they they were not really given a fair trial they were given a sham trial they were put to death for no reason and our takeaway as modern people is like haha look at the look how evil those superstitious people were and they put all these people to death and that's evil and wrong and we shouldn't do that anymore i generally agree with that um although i think witchcraft is a real thing and there are certainly people who practice it, both men and women. And unfortunately, they may claim they're trying to commune with nature or whatever. Like w Wicca is a very nature-based religion, so to speak. But biblically speaking, there is no God of nature, right? There's only God and the devil, right? Angels and demons, and that's it. So if they are, in fact, communicating with some sort of supernatural force, you know it's not God. Because God does not appear in the form of paganism, it must be the devil. 
And anytime you mess with the devil, you're, you're playing a dangerous game for sure. So I'm not a fan of witchcraft. I generally believe it, it is just as evil as the Bible says that it is, but I do fall short of condemning the people who practice it themselves because God loves those people too. And what I'm starting with today is actually a couple images that I'm going to ask the producer to show for you as we discuss them. The first is an image that comes from, uh, I believe it's the French Revolution. And so it's it's not specifically um, religious in nature. Like the French Revolution was a war against God, ultimately. But if you kind of study it out, you realize that it happened in phases. And the most horrific phase of it is, is known as the reign of terror, R-E-I-G-N of terror, in which case thousands upon thousands of people were put to death for all sorts of reasons. That, that's, that was really where the revolution began to eat itself, like most revolutions do. Uh, the exception really being the American Revolution, where we institutionalized all of that post revolt fighting into the legal system. But most of the time, the revolution succeeds and then eats itself afterwards. And that's what happened in France. So this image is an image of a woman who's been stripped naked and is being like forced into this crate. And once she is imprisoned in the crate, they're going to dunk the crate in water until she drowns because they believe she's a witch. Um, this is not the only way that witches were persecuted, so to speak. If you go back in time even farther than that, there was an entire non-biblical like mythology of witches that said that they received their power from the earth itself. And therefore, if you could remove their connection to the earth by literally hoisting them up into the air, then their power of witchcraft would be um, taken away. And so women were often stripped naked. Now, why do you always strip a, a, a woman naked before you punish her? I can only speculate, but they were, they were stripped naked and shoved into boxes like this and then hoisted off the ground. And they would remain there in this suspended state until they were dead, you know, and they would die of exposure or die of whatever would get them. The church has treated witches badly and has put them to death in these horrific, degrading ways. I would dare say most of the time falsely. In fact, 100% of the time falsely because um, any and all instructions to be lethal toward witches is Old Testament stuff. Christ came along and turned that entire paradigm on its head, even though he's the same God. And I'm not one of those people who divorces the Old Testament from the new. Nonetheless, he just gave us all a different way of interacting with the world that has been redeemed by his blood and his grace, where now we're supposed to love our enemies and preach the wicked into a relationship with Jesus rather than taking the sword against them. So I think 100% of the time when the ancient church did this kind of thing, it was wrong. And then... Even beyond that, it was probably wrong and also baseless. I gave the producer another picture to show you. These are, it's a picture of three almost knives. These are called witch prickers. Because again, a non-biblical mythology of witches was that a true witch would have a place on her body that was impervious to pain. So one of the ways that you would prove a woman was a witch was to stab her repeatedly until you found her devil's mark. That's what they called it. So you'd use a witch pricker, which is really just a knife, to stab this poor woman and stab her and stab her and stab her, like you're in a scream movie, until, and you would actually hire a witch pricker person to come do this. So you'd earn your money by stabbing a woman to death, stabbing probably a naked woman to death. Um, but he would have one of his witch prickers that had a retractable blade in it. So once he has sufficiently proven that she's human enough through murder, essentially murdering her, he stabs her one final time with the retractable blade, which does not puncture her skin and therefore does not cause her to cry out in pain. And lo and behold, you found her devil's mark. She definitely is a witch and you can put her to death in a clean conscience. 
all of this is evil stuff. And it's examples of how lawfare can be waged with the war of God. So I'm not suggesting to you that any of this is good. I'm just reporting it as the truth. That being said, let's go to the article for today. This now brings the concept of divine lawfare into the modern world <laughs> where we're not stripping women naked and, and drowning them or, or stabbing them to death because they're witches anymore. But modern divine lawfare does take a different form. So in this article by MarkAllenSchleski.com, it's a blog post and it's dated 2015. So it's an older article, but all the principles in it are still true. It's called When the Bible's Been Used to Bash, Clobber, or Hurt You. And it reads, um, I was in my church office as a pastor. A woman sitting in the chair across from me was crying. My heart was breaking for her. She had just confessed to me, apparently embarrassed and ashamed, that she felt enormous anger about the Bible. There were parts that she couldn't even bring herself to read. Hearing her story, I wondered how she had hung in with the church for so long. She said it was because she loved Jesus. She was so moved by who Jesus is and what he had meant in her life. But Paul, that was another thing. So many stories, so many verses, Paul's verses mostly, that had been used to shut down conversation with her, to put her in her place, to explain away her story, to cut her out of community. Like the modern version of shoving her in a box and drowning her. She wasn't arguing with Paul or suggesting his ideas were culturally bound. This was not an intellectual disagreement. This was pain. People had used these words to exclude and demean her. Whole sections of the Bible were clouded over in the fog of these experiences. Something meant to be life-giving has been used to harm, to limit, to silence, and to exclude. This woman had experienced spiritual abuse. The words of the Bible have been used over and over again by people wanting to exclude or shut down or control. The book becomes a bludgeon. Some people wielding the bludgeon even think they are helping, doing something in love. But instead of these words giving life, they do damage. And not for nothing, like, again, there's nothing good or righteous about the witch prickers of the past. But I'm willing to entertain the idea that all of the people involved also believed that they were doing something good, right? Because they read about how they read or heard about how wicked witches are. And in their minds, they mean they have to go dispose of the witches. So bad actions, but fueled by something that appeared good in their brains. All right, let's, let's jump down um, in the article a little bit, uh, this is a section called Steps Toward Healing, and it's kind of a how-to to overcome the spiritual abuse you've received. I'm going down to number two of that section. And we'll start reading with this. For context, you can read it on your own, what has come before this. But this brings something clearly into focus. Some Christians wield scripture as a way to justify their own authority. Some use scripture as a means of control and manipulation. When this becomes clear, especially if you learn the verses were used out of context or without concern for the nuance of the text, you can hold the perpetrators responsible instead of the text that was misused against you. Never forget this. The Bible does not belong to the Christians who hurt you. Their interpretation of it is not the final word. If those people claim to be Christians, then they are accountable to a large community presently and across time, that lives in submission to the Bible and intention, intention with it. Even Jesus challenged judgmental religious people who used scripture to justify themselves and condemn others. Um, you know what? My producer and I had a passage from the book of Galatians prepared, and maybe I, in fact, will use that. But as I was reading through the article... A different passage jumped to my head. So, uh, brother producer, if you would pull up John chapter 8, that's where I think I'd like to start, and then we'll see what our time is looking like after that. John chapter 8 has an excellent story of this kind of spiritual lawfare. This is the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. Now, 
you hopefully know this story. Um, you find it in John 8, verses 1 through 11. And in a nutshell, what happens is the the religious leaders are trying to trick and trap Jesus, specifically with regard to the law of Moses, which the culture at the time really held in very, very high esteem. So they're trying to get Jesus to either disregard the law of Moses, which would diminish his authority, would really destroy his authority in that culture, or to uphold it in a cruel way, which would diminish his popularity amongst the people. They think they've got him cornered, right? But Jesus, nobody ever corners Jesus. So what they do is they, they bring a woman to him who is caught in adultery. And they confront him with verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such a woman should be stoned. But what do you say? And they're referencing the law of Moses, wherein physical adultery was a really big crime. Um, it was such a big crime that uh, <laughs> that if you were a daughter of a priest who was caught in adultery, you were not only killed, you were killed in a really horrifically brutal way, like killed with fire. So you're saying, hey, the law of Moses says that we should stone this woman to death for what she has done. And Jesus gets out of the problem. Uh, we can just read it. Verse six, this they said, testing him, that he that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So they continued asking him. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then he goes down and writes again. And everybody who was trying to trap Jesus for whatever reason that is not exactly specified in the text here, they have a change of heart and they slink away. They, they, they discontinue their attempt to destroy this woman. Uh, and then verse 10, they've all, they've all gone away. So verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so this is a great story. Um, but we're using it. I mean, it's a great story that is law and grace together in the same place because Jesus does not actually take away the penalty of being caught in adultery. He says, all right, you go ahead. and you. Yes, the law is good and she is deserving of death. So, and then he brings mercy into the whole thing and says, so the one of you who actually has the right to do it, the one of you who is sin-free yourself, you go grab a stone. And I believe strongly, and I can even argue it from a chiastic perspective, I believe what he was doing writing in, this, in the dirt was writing the sins of the people who were there so that they, don't, they can't even claim to be sinless, to have an excuse to throw a rock at this woman. He's calling them out in their sin so that they know they have no moral authority to execute the law against her. It's a great story. I love this story. But I'm using it again today specifically because of the misuse of the law or the law fair that is going on here. How many people does it take to commit adultery? That's not a trick question. I'll give you a hint. It's a pretty small number. Two or more. Obviously, you can commit adultery in larger groups, but you need at least two. There has to be a man and a woman, right? There has, has to be a partner in the adultery uh, or else it's just self-pleasure, right? So where was the man? The man is not present. They went and got the woman and brought her to Jesus, but the man is nowhere in sight. And again, I firmly believe that the man was a plant one of the accusers themselves, where he tricked this woman, offered her money or something or other to get her into this compromising position just so that he could then drag her in front of Jesus for this purpose. That's lawfare. That's not law. That's lawfare. And you see that Jesus doesn't take the bait. He is not interested in lawfare at all. He 
wants to uphold the standards of the law by mixing it with love, grace, and mercy. And so when law and grace come together, that's how you see God for who he really is. Do we have time for Galatians? Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Um, this, pat, this is written by Paul, so this is one of the reasons we indicated it. Uh, the article we read, uh, the woman in the article that we read has a problem with Paul, so I thought we'd go straight to the source and read some Paul. But Paul uh, is tough to understand, and we could probably talk an hour on just this little passage, so I don't have that kind of time. Let's just read verses 21 through 25 of Galatians chapter 3. it is. Paul writes, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor, some translations say schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So Paul is doing his very best here to make a verbal argument that Jesus was illustrating with his actions in John chapter 8. Paul is saying, is the law bad? No way, right? Is it against the promises of God? Is it somehow contrary to the gospel? Certainly not. I believe the original King James says, God forbid there. So, and then he explains why not. He says, well, if the law was able to bring life, then we could absolutely go to the law to get life. But that's not how it is. Because the law brings death. Verse 22 says, the scripture has confined, confined all under sin. What does that mean? Well, the scripture contains lots of laws. The, the 10 big ones, right? The 10 commandments, but then literally hundreds more laws in the, in the law of Moses. And when we read the experience of the early Christian church, uh, specifically in Acts chapter 15, at the Jerusalem Council, we see that they all uniformly acknowledge that it is completely impossible to perfectly keep the law of Moses. They just can't do it. It's too complex, it's too nuanced, and it's ultimately contrary to human nature in a sinful world. And so they make this collective decision in the Jerusalem Council to not enforce the law of Moses on the new believers. Say, like, this is not for you. And it became not really a way that the Christian church operated from that point on. So, if nobody can keep the law of Moses, that means everybody is a sinner, and the consequence for sin is death. Either right now, temporarily, because, you know, it's a civil judgment, or ultimately, in the long run, before the throne of God, it's, it's permanent, eternal death. So, that's Paul's way of saying the law can't give life. All it brings is death. It shows you life, but if you don't attain it, and you can't attain it, then the only thing it will actually provide is death. Right? So that is not the way to eternal life. That's not the way to righteousness. Um, but the second half of verse 22 says, it's because of all that death that the law brings that the gospel of Jesus Christ is so powerful because he comes along and says that the law has no hold over you anymore because I, Jesus, have perfectly kept the law on your behalf and you just have to have faith in what I have done. And my righteousness gets imparted to you by faith. Hallelujah. And that, that's the same gospel promise for you and for me as well. But then verse 23, Paul says, Before faith came, before the days of Jesus, we were kept under guard by the law. What does that mean? 
Well, I think it means a lot of things, but we're kept under guard. It means it shows us the right way to live. It, it was ultimately responsible for establishing the society into which Jesus could be born to say the things that he said and do the things that he did and not, well, I mean, he was nailed to a tree until he died, but where it, the people even would have an ability to understand him. Not all the people, obviously, but you need a culture that is immersed in the things of God in order to value the son of God when he shows up to tell you the things of God, right? And so the law kept us under guard. It kept us safe. It kept us alive. It kept us thinking about the things of God until Jesus came. And then he showed us the right way. Verse 24 says, therefore, the law was our tutor or our schoolmaster um, because it does, in fact, teach us right from wrong. The law says, do not commit adultery. And that may even seem like common sense to you if you're a believer, but look at the world around you. The world doesn't think that's common sense. The, you know, when I was a kid, if you wanted dirty pictures, you had to actually like fess up. <laughs> you had to talk to the clerk in the convenience store. You had to grab the magazine from the back row and it was all entombed in plastic and then go and like present it to the clerk and pay your money and have to like confront that shame to be introducing yourself to dirty pictures. You don't have to do that anymore, do you? You have a supercomputer in your pocket. You have instant access to all the smut that you want to for free, probably, if you know how to find it. So no, the world doesn't agree. Do not commit adultery. The world like uplifts adultery. We've gotten to a place now where sex work is real work. <laughs> no, the world loves adultery. The world loves murder. Watch anything on Netflix and you're bound to see lots and lots and lots of murder. Right? The world is opposed to the things of God. That's why the, the law of God shows us what is right and what is wrong. Because the world is not going to show us. It has to be the law. Um, and it would bring us to Christ because the illustration I, I love to use is that um, the law is like, it's like, sin is like dirt, you know, it's like working under a car all day and you're all covered in oil and grime and gunk. And so you go in the bathroom, you look in the mirror, you see that you're all gunky. The law is the mirror. The law is what reflects you back to you and gives you a standard by which to understand what you're seeing. The law is not the water and soap to make you clean. It's just the mirror. And when you realize you have a problem, the realization of that problem points you to the answer to that problem, which is Jesus. Jesus is that water and soap that makes you clean. Obviously, there's there are a lot more words that can be used to do proper justice to this Pauline passage, but we're going to call it quits there because what we've seen today is that it's easy and it's natural to the human heart to wage lawfare against our enemies or the people that we don't like in the name of God. But just because it's easy doesn't mean it's good. The scripture itself says it's not good, and the example of Jesus shows us it's not good. So let us use the scripture and the law of God in the right way to realize our sin so that we can go to Jesus to be cleansed. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, show us the right way to use the law for ourselves and not as a weapon against others. And always use the law to bring us to the foot of the cross where we can meet Jesus in his name. Amen. Friends, I'll see you Friday for the last installment of our show on Lawfare this week. May God bless you until then.